I, I don't consider myself the father of Fantana, now uh, Roche Tissue. I consider myself the grandfather. So <laughs> a, a lot of my perspective now is that, you know, I'm proud of the kids and uh, I'm proud oh, of what nice. they're doing. And it's very important to the future of the business that uh, uh, everything I had to give, they, uh, they, they uh, embody, you know what I mean? So it's sort of like, I don't know if you have kids and grandkids, but the point at which you, uh, you no longer have to instruct them because they hear your voice, <laughs> right? So, uh, yeah, I, 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 that's the point of satisfaction. With your own children, that can take 30 years. <laughs> sure. <laughs> In the case of Ventana, it took me 30 years to feel that comfortable. We, we had this issue of uh, a human trying to tell a computer what to do and what to do involved hundreds of possible actions. And we had tried numerous ways to do that in a kludgy way. And here's our head engineer, Chuck Hassan, standing in line at a grocery store. And he's watching his groceries get barcoded. To what purpose? To determine his, you know, the price, uh, what he owes to pay, but also the inventory. And it occurs to him that all medical tests should be done that way, sure. right? And remember, this is 1988. There was no such insight in 1988, right? We were all just getting used to barcoding. And it revolutionized everything because all of a sudden you had the human computer interface, right? And uh, yeah, and, and that happened at a grocery store. Sure. Yeah. The other significant thing was on the chemistry side that uh, Phil Miller, who was our head scientist, had been 20 years at Abbott, uh, new medical instruments and assays. And um, we were working on making tests that anyone could do. And uh, we, we get, came to a dead end. And that was that um, our, our tests, which to, to drive the reaction, we needed to heat. When we heated, we would evaporate all of the uh, solutions off of the, the glass slide that held the biopsy tissue. And we tried numerous ways to deal with that. And one day he's in total frustration and we were all thinking it's the end of the idea. He's jogging in Sabino Canyon and it occurs to him what the answer is. And the answer is he decides to float a light oil over the solutions, the aqueous or water solutions, to hold all the reactants in. And the oil wouldn't evaporate at the temperatures we were at. And now it's 30 some years later, and that is the governing principle of what we do. Uh, and it's a guy jogging in Sabino Canyon. <laughs> From the very beginning, we had a culture of high purpose. We were doing something really important. Uh, we, I hired people that came from industries that had built instruments and tests that had never been built before. So they had a high tolerance for the difficulty factor, right? And then the other thing that I think is really important about a culture was the sense of cohesion, that you're in with your mates, that you're in, you know, it's not just you, but it's other smart people around you that are just as committed. And so then what happens is you have this daily experience of things are difficult and things are failing and you don't know and you've run out of ideas. But the people around you are, are hustling. They're, 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 they're also thinking, right? And to me, there's this very critical moment um, in, that... Uh, comes to be, and that is, we have this notion that everything important occurs because of an individual's intelligence. But imagine you have a group of people, 10, 15, 20 people, and their intelligence is collective. 
right? So any one of us, as impressive as we could be, might have an IQ of 140 or 150. But imagine what the IQ of 20 people is. It's 20 times that, sure. right? You're, you're operating on an IQ that's north of 1,000. So what impedes that uh, IQ is individual uh, ego, um, the, the sense that you're just out for yourself, uh, the sense of, you know, that you lack confidence in asserting yourself, that you don't have anything to contribute. I mean, when you have a culture in which uh, you have collective intelligence, then you're proceeding by alliance and you're proceeding with a cohesion. And I think the only way to get that is through a common purpose. Yeah, so Tom Weiser, when he was 40, uh, presented with a metastatic colon cancer, and he had something like 15 tumors in his lungs. Um, he was one of our top salespeople, a, a really gung-ho, go-get-em guy, and just struck down as if hit by lightning. And uh, within a matter of months, it looked like he was going to die. And uh, he had initial some response to treatment. And then it was, um, you know, how to prepare for the inevitable. And he was not a prepare for the inevitable guy. He, he pushed and pushed that th some of those lung tumors should be biopsied, removed, and that would cure him. And then he, uh, it, the surgeons pointed out, no one's ever been cured that way. And he reasoned that, well, since I responded initially, the thing that's growing in my lungs must be different somehow. So we did the biopsy and uh, sure enough, it had changed. And so it started us down a path which happened over the next nine years, seven times, that it would be treated with a drug specific to that uh, tumor, which had changed, which had evolved. Uh, and he, they, we'd find a drug and he'd get a response. And we went through that seven times. And uh, so it, it, this goes back, you know, uh, now uh, a decade in which uh, physicians didn't think this way. There was, the, the tumor was one thing and you treat it one way. And we, fr from Tom, we began to learn that you, you want to keep those biopsies going, do that chemistry, learn what the driving force is and find the drug. And, um, you know, fortuitously, the Swiss came, Roche came, acquired the company, they made, they were the beginning producers of those targeted drugs. And they, their insight was uh, the drug wouldn't get used unless you had the test to point out this change. And so Tom became the guy among the, the hundreds of Ventana employees that we all knew. He, he represented the improbability of someone in the full vigor of life being struck down. Then he represented the fight of it. He represented that everything new and different we could do helped, right? And so he, that was it. He became really what I would call a, a central figure. And the moment that I realized that he, he led me to this conclusion that we had through our culture, in our collective being, we had a soul, was on the occasion in Sacramento when I was standing in, in church giving his eulogy. And I looked at, at, across the, the church and there had to be 40 or 50 Montana employees. I mean, there were people who flew from Europe. There were people that flew from around the country. And I realized uh, it was that sense of a family and of a collective being, and then that there was a collective uh, sense of value and sensitivity. And so I don't know exactly how you define the soul, but, and, and certainly we all have the notion of an individual having a soul, but how about the idea that a group of people could have a soul?
why why is Montana Roche in Oro Valley? Okay, and it, it begins with um, the importance of the University of Arizona. I have the d distinct uh, feeling that universities per se produce wealth. And Montana uh, Roche is an example of that. I, I after all, was a state employee at the University of Arizona when I had my idea. Administrators at the university eventually helped me achieve my goal of, of this idea, a private company coming out of a public university. At many levels, I found someone in the, at the university, in the community, even in the legislature that said, yeah, this is the way we should be thinking, right? So then how specifically did we end up in Oro Valley? Well, once we get going, uh, we, we rented a series of small open spaces and almost garage-like spaces. And within seven or eight years, we were in a dozen locations. And what started to happen was we started selling instruments and tests in Europe. And we would have institutions, um, healthcare systems, um, universities where they wanted to come and see where the instruments and tests were produced. And uh, I, I needed to move away from uh, uh, being on the wrong side of the tracks next to the waste treatment plant. And uh, so Oro Valley, because we are a scientific company, because we have engineers, scientists, uh, people that uh, from, we have employees from 28 countries, we have visitors from all over the world, we looked for the place that was uh, the most becoming environment, right? And that was Oro Valley. So uh, Dave, it, you know, uh, we can talk about the broader influence, but the fact is uh, I ended up having to use my own technology and my own family. I, uh, I, I'll just plug my book here, Chasing sure. the Invisible. Uh, and uh, in it, I tell the story of my mother, my wife, and myself when we were all hit with a, a lethal circumstance. And it turns out um, that the way that Ventana Roche technology played into it was there's always this time in medicine when the next thing is going to happen. And a lot of times technology serves that up but it isn't yet universal, right? So an example we all know of in the last year is what I would call the miracle of the vaccine, right? That um, historically we would have been three years making this vaccine, but the fact that it went from a genetic code directly to a coded uh, version of that that's injected in you that you produce the antibody to, the future of this is that all vaccines will be made this way, right? And so there's this moment in time where it turns out that technology was out there having related to Ebola, but it was a very rare use. And so it came to universal use, right? So the way I, the way I look at it is, um, yeah, it's it, it, medicine changes over time and it changes because of this imperative that it's got to be better than the way it was. Continued good health to you, Tom, and enjoy those grandkids up there in Colorado for sure. And uh, I love the book. I thought the book was great, and, and uh, I will refer to it moving forward too. All the best.